On today's podcast, we are starting a new segment called No One Asked Us, where we review a more recent nutrition article on things that are changing in our world of health. And today's article is about implementing medication and surgery for young children with obesity. So we are going to give our opinion on that, our thoughts on the medications for the obesity. And so even though no one asked us, here's our opinion. Live your life within the moment, moment, and don't go wait until the morning, morning. You never know when it is over, over. All that I know. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to our new segment. So Liz and I, I hope we're we're recording. I know. We're also hoping. So Art isn't feeling great. So he went to go take a nap and he basically told us one button to push. So I'm hoping that we did that one button correctly. (laughs) If you guys don't know, Liz and Becca have had many. Oh, this is going to be great. We can talk about this on Friday. How many failures that we've had in our day. Oh, good Lord. Remember that one time that we filmed... I don't know, an entire course. It was like five or six videos. And then we like, oh yeah, they all disappeared. We either didn't hit record or we deleted them or something. We spent like hours, guys, like multiple hours. And Liz and I only get together once or twice a week. It was like a whole day we lost. It might've been a whole day of recording that was lost. I probably drank a bottle of wine that night. (laughs) In frustration. This is a couple of years ago. But anyways, welcome to our new segment. I'll let Becca do the introduction today. Yeah. So I am Becca Tosinkowski. I am a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. Liz Roman is with me. We are business partners for Fit Mom. Liz is a nutrition therapy practitioner. Um, We are here to essentially shed light onto the health culture that is today because it is full of a bunch of BS and diets and fads and things that are ruining your health. And we want to kind of bring light to all of that and give you the truth, which isn't always what you love to hear, but that's what we're here for because no one can talk back to us. So that's why we podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Nobody can talk back to us. And here's another, this new segment, Liz and I There have been a number of articles, news articles that have come out recently that are very upsetting. And Liz and I decided to do a segment called No One Asked Us, which is basically us taking these articles and doing a personal review on them. (laughs) <laughs> which I thought would be fun and informational. Uh-huh. Yeah. So if you guys have any articles that you want us to review and give our opinion on, email those over info at fitmomlife.com or you can go to fitmomlife.com backslash ask and submit your questions. If you want to have us answer something, you know, if you want to explain a little bit about you, what's going on, we would be more than happy to do that on the podcast. So that is how you can connect with us and engage on the podcast. But yeah, I mean, This, when I read this article, first I got really sad and then I just got really pissed off. Yes. I feel like a lot of people, you know, just see things and kind of, okay, like it's just another news article and you don't really know what to believe, but this has gained a lot of traction and we've seen a lot of people posting about it. And so we just had to commit to doing a full podcast on it. And so what we're going to talk about today is the CBS news article titled consider drugs and surgery early for obesity in kids. New guideline says waiting doesn't work. So Liz and I have small children. We obviously work in health. Um, and I, 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 I shouldn't even say I'm surprised to be totally honest Um, I think that our, unfortunately, our medical system has become very much infiltrated and controlled by the drug administration, by insurance companies, Mm -hmm. and by people, maybe not directly, but maybe directly looking for money. And so what they are basically doing is they are allowing now for children as young as 12 to be given medications for obesity and children as young as 13 to be basically referred to for surgery. Traumatizing. Talk about traumatizing. Let's talk about it from a kid's standpoint. Yes. You know? And, and here's the really hard thing is that most studies are short-term studies on a lot of these drugs, on a lot of these surgeries, on a lot of this, because you are not going to get a whole lot of funding and investment on someone that says, I want to p- give someone this drug and watch them for the next decade. No, they want like eight to 12 week studies. And so the same is for birth control, like same as for statins, same, like you do not understand that what you are being told about the drugs that you are consuming or the drugs that are now being given to our children 
is that we really only know what this does for the next few months, maybe a year. There is very little known about these drugs that they are. So if anyone's heard of semaglitude, semaglitude is a new type of weight loss drug. And there's been a number of different weight loss drugs that have come out. And same thing with metformin. So those, many of us that are listening are probably on metformin. I know a number of clients even that are on metformin. And metformin initially improves blood sugars. But then it actually starts to make blood sugars worse. And it starts to make insulin resistance worse. And so those of us that are on metformin for years, I, I would assume your things probably haven't gotten better. Your situation hasn't gotten better. Your health, your weight, your symptoms. And that is my concern for this, is that we are going to be giving children who, I'll be, I'll be frank, it's probably not even their freaking fault that mm-hmm. they are obese. It is probably the environment that they're in. It is probably, let's look at the parents. Let's mm-hmm. look at, and I'm, I don't mean to blame anyone, but let's, I mean, like, is your child active? Are, they, are you feeding them healthy food? Because I would love to be given an example of a child that is active daily, that is given healthy food, that struggles with massive obesity. Yeah. I mean, they're talking about the 95th percentile, 120 percentile here for, you know, obesity, um, in terms of considering obese or, you know, extremely obese, severe obesity. What we know, I'm only going to speak from my personal experience and what we've seen for the past 20 years, what we've heard from hundreds of clients is this. We know a couple of things today in the conventional medicine space. And that is one, your doctors don't talk to each other. Two, very rarely is there in-depth consultation on diet and lifestyle, okay? So you might meet with somebody in the hospital. You might meet with a registered dietitian or a nutritionist who's going to give you a paper to go home and say, make these changes. Very rarely is there follow-ups. Very rarely is there psychological work that's being done sometimes, and hopefully for these little ones, there definitely you know is, Um education around what leads them to this place and how they can get out of this place. What does it mean to eat healthier, right? So what we know is that the doctors don't spend enough time with their patients already. They don't ask enough questions because they don't have the time because of the insurance guidelines, depending upon the type of insurance, right? We also know that they're not trained in nutrition. Doctors take, what, four hours of nutrition education, I believe. And again, this is not to discredit the education from the doctors. The doctors are doing their job and what they're trained in, what their expertise is in. We're not coming on the podcast claiming to be scientists, right? That's not what we do. What we do is we work with people who are struggling with metabolic syndrome, lifestyle disease, and dysfunction to understand how their body works and how their systems work together, the importance of a good quality nutritional diet, balancing that and adjusting ratios based upon the individual, and then looking at underlying factors, right? So maybe this child was born with some predisposition here. Hmm. Does that mean that medication is the only answer or should be and the way that we're reading this, you know, is that this is just <sighs> one quote here says, obesity is not a lifestyle problem. It is not a lifestyle disease. It predominantly emerges from biological factors. I'm going to call bullshit. I, and here's the thing. Can you have, and I think any intelligent health professional will tell you this. You have genetics, mm-hmm. obviously. And those genetics you are born with. But then there's something called epigenetics. And epigenetics is the influence of your genetics from lifestyle factors. Basically, you have this beautiful piano in front of you. You're the one playing the keys. What keys are you going to play? Mm-hmm. And so you need, you need to understand. And two, can I, like, and those of you that say, well, that's evil to think that kids should diet. If you think that diet culture and eating healthy and exercising is evil, or that those of us that say that children should be doing that, I think you're a different kind of evil, that you think that kids should be pushed drugs for something that could be solved with what as humans we were intended to do, which is be active and eat food that's nutrient dense. And can we please just evaluate how giving drugs and doing weight loss surgeries working for the adult population? We are more obese and overweight and unhealthy than ever. Our life expectancy is going down 
now rapidly, and I think it will continue to do so because of things like this, because let's just give drugs at younger ages. Mm -hmm. Let's just do diagnoses at younger ages and put people on drugs that they will be on for the rest of their lives Mm -hmm. with no idea of how it's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. And I'm not saying I am anti-medications. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying there needs to be a bigger evaluation and approach to these things. And unfortunately, when we are only in the conventional medicine realm, it's a very closed approach. It is diet. I'm sorry. It is medications and surgery. Those are the two tools that conventional medicine has in most situations. That, that's what they're trained on. That's what Liz was saying. That's essentially what they're trained on to do. So of course, this is their solution. Yeah, because it feeds pharmaceutical profits, right? Which feeds their pockets. We're not going to get into that whole big conversation uh, today. But what I think about as a mother is, I think I said this on a podcast a couple weeks ago. What I'm always thinking about for Marcus, what is he going to say to me? What is he going to, you know, when he's in, you know, his older years, his teen years, you know, maybe he's 18 and he's getting ready to move out of that house or go to college or whatever he decides to do. What is he going to say to me? Mom, why didn't you help me with this? Why did you let me be so overweight? You guys, Beck and I were both overweight as children. There was a period of time that I blamed my mom. I blamed our genetics, actually, Mm -hmm. that I was fat and chubby. Mm -hmm. Y'all, I ate too much. That was my problem. (laughs) <laughs> I ate way too much yeah. and not the right foods. But the hamburger story, right? Or was it the hamburger? Yes, it yeah. was the McDonald's story. Um, so, you know, we've both been there. One, your confidence as a child is belittled because you you feel like the I was always the bigger girl. I was always yeah. the chubby girl, right? And I blamed it on some medications and things like that. But then there was definitely this on or off switch. Like, again, I've shared this before. We were either like late night steak and shake, milkshake, burger and fries, or we were like at the health food store shopping for all this shit that tastes like grass. Um, so we have to, I, I guess as a mom, I just think, am I doing my due diligence to promote a healthy lifestyle? And that starts in the home by setting the example. Okay. So this is probably going to hurt some people's feelings, but I think it has to be said. If you are not setting the example in your home by teaching your kids the basic things, how to cook, right? How to grocery shop, taking the kids to the store, getting them involved, grocery list. Like Marcus loves going to the grocery store. He tells me what we need on the grocery list, right? I get him involved. He likes cooking with me. Last night, he put his own chicken nuggets in the air fryer, you know? And so I'm trying to get him involved and and that starts in the home and that requires energy and it requires a level of effort to be involved with them. The second thing I'm going to say here is get your kids outside, Mm -hmm. move with them, go to the park, play, put your damn cell phone down. And I'm speaking to myself here a little bit too. So I am definitely not immune to this. But you go back to, Art and I were talking about this the other day when we were walking, you go back to our age when, you know, we grew up in the 90s. We didn't have cell phones, Mm -mm. right? We had a a home phone that I was able to call my friends and that they didn't answer. Guess what I had to do? I had to ride my bike or walk my ass to their house and be like, hey, do you want to play outside? Yes. I wasn't allowed to watch TV until all my chores were done. Mm-hmm. I wasn't allowed to watch TV until my homework was done. I wasn't allowed to watch TV until I had played outside for a certain amount of time. My mom was like, I don't care. Go outside, ride your bike, do something, yeah. do some yard work. Yeah. So these are frontline things that I think we have to evaluate as parents. And this is something that I'm going to strive to do. Again, as we've said before, Becca and I have little ones, but I'm already thinking about if I'm not doing these things, I'm coming home and I'm sitting my butt on the couch and I'm just letting my kid be on YouTube all the time. And there's certain times and certain places for these things to happen. You know, society has changed. We'll be honest. Like Liz yeah. and I are not perfect. My kid watches YouTube. Yeah. He watches his tablet sometimes. Like, But you got to have it, a balance. There's a balance. I, I do not. I, I think it's very hard. I'll be say I, I do think it's very hard in today's society to completely eliminate that stuff because for they're sure. exposed to it with friends. They're ex- like, yeah. it's just a way of life. He has it at school. He has a tablet that they use at school for yeah. learning stuff. So like we get that, but there are absolutely ways that you can be better. Mm-hmm. There always are as a parent. Like I'm trying to think all the time of what can I do with Carson so that he doesn't want to just watch TV? Like mm-hmm. rack or and- how can I make different changes in the house so that he's not just eating straight sugar all the time. I mean, they're still going to get in the freezer and get their ice cream out. 
you know, but we're looking at the, the grand, the bigger picture here, yes. the grand scheme of things. And that, I mean, I just like read this and it makes me sick to my stomach because there's not, first of all, there's not enough education to adults today who are struggling with obesity. Um, I was listening to uh, one of the mentors that we've uh, been listening a lot to, Vince Pitstick, and he was talking about, you know, these international organizations that have done research over the years and what they're estimating is that 70% of the world's population is going to be obese, suffering from lifestyle disease by 2030. That's in seven years. I was thinking about that today in my workout. How old that's will I be terrifying. in 2030? It's terrifying. And we're going to be here for it. And so that's why we're on the front lines and we're speaking the truth and we're getting fired up about this today. Because if you guys go and you read this article, some of the things in here, like it just doesn't even make sense. And here's what pisses me off. And I'm about like back around because I'm about to be done with this. Still specific doses of this semaglitude and other anti-obesity drugs have been hard to get because of recent shortages caused by manufacturing problems and high demand spurred in part by celebrities on TikTok and other social media platforms boasting about enhanced weight loss. Mic drop, there's a problem. Well, of course you're going to have enhanced weight loss initially. Talk to me in five years. That is what our concern is. And what this talks about too is let's talk about how the drug works. The drug affects how the pathways between the brain and the gut regulate energy. It works on how your brain and stomach communicate with one another and it helps you feel more full than you would be. Two things. One, your body is constantly changing and adapting. Do not even try to tell me that your body over time is not going to adapt to this and it is going to have a moot point. You are basically like, it is going to lose its effect. So guess what? You'll probably need higher doses. You'll need a different drug. You will need to be shackled to this forever. The other problem, we are seeing over and over people that are not overeating, that are overweight and unhealthy. I know lots of them because we work with them yep. that come to us eating 1,400, 1,600 calories consistently and yes, diligently, not lying about it and active and they are struggling with weight and health because it is not just a matter of calories in, calories out, and exercise. For children, I believe it is. For adults, it starts to become levels of toxicity. It starts to become dysfunction within their body, too chronic of stress. And if you give a child a medication, you are basically telling them, to a child, this is how I imagine it would be felt. There is something wrong with you. You have to take this for the rest of your life because mm -hmm. you will never be able to fix it on your own. Or that you can just take a pill to solve your problems and we don't have to work on the lifestyle factors. Again, every person in this situation is going to be different. Is there underlying factors and dysfunction? Then sh sure, it might serve a purpose in some situations. But this is an article that's going out across CBS News, right? And it just what I originally hear when I, I see this is, hey, we got another solution mm -hmm. to mask your problems, to take away the need for learning, education, and hard work. And it's just our society today is becoming so reliant on pills and what's sub I mean, even supplements. We're going to talk, I mean, let's roll up supplements here. I tell my clients all the time, you, you can't just take the supplements and expect that, like, for example, fat burner. Like I used mm. to say to my girlfriend, like, you can't just take a fat burner and then eat the entire Casey's pizza that you bought for five bucks. She loved those things. Five bucks a pop, right? Uh, I get uh, it. It's cheap. But then she would be spending $40 on the fat burners. And so we say these things like jokingly, but what message does it send to our children? And on the flip side of this, I just think about their nourishment and their needs for growth and development, their brain, their cognition, their hormones as they're going through. We're talking about 12 and 13 year olds. When did you get your cycle? I think I got mine when I was 11. I was in sixth grade, however old I was. Then. I just remember it was Christmas day oh. and I started screaming for the bathroom and then my mom was downstairs. It was the Christmas that I got my Tommy Hilfiger outfit and my perfume. And she's so funny. She like was downstairs and I just have to tell this because it's funny. Uh, <laughs> we had a fireplace that was recently put in. She was like banging, like, I don't know if she had a broom or what she was doing, but she wanted to make it sound like it came from Santa, <laughs> like through the chimney. Uh. So I come downstairs or I'm like yelling upstairs. I was like, mom, I'm bleeding, you know? Um, 
anyways, so then I was excited after that, but it was horrible and excruciating pain. But here's what I think about, you know, from the hormonal standpoint, if you're put on these medications that suppress your appetite, then you're not getting enough nourishment. And then we also look at the contraindications and depletions of these things. What else is going on? Liver burden of having to take a medication daily and your liver and having to deal with it. Like there are so anxiety, neurotransmitters, you guys, there's so much. And also let's just like, this medication is $1,300 a month. If insurance doesn't pay for it, tell me someone's not making money from that Mm -hmm. and preying on your children Mm -hmm. and on your, as a parent, just wanting to help your kid. I get it. And as the doctor, this is an easy fix. I don't have to deal with this problem. I just give you the medication. Thank God for some of the doctors that are interviewed in this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dr. Robert Lustig, he's a longtime specialist in pediatric, pediatric endocrinology. And he said, I'm not that, not that I'm against medications. I'm against the willy nilly use of these medications without addressing the cause of the problem. And then another doctor, Dr. Stephanie Byrne, a pedi- pediatrician at Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, said, I'd like more research about the drug's efficacy in a more diverse group of children and about potential long-term effects. Yeah. Hopefully we get those, Dr. Byrne. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we will. And I feel bad for the, the, the subjects that are going to be part of that. You know, I, and, and so they're, they're saying exactly what we're saying here, right, in terms of other lifestyle factors, right? And, and maybe we're reading this a little bit too harshly and maybe there is going to be a very intensive process that they've made sure that the child is getting X amount of minutes in terms of movement and yep. that they've been con- you know, given the consultations from dietitians and, and things like that uh, in the hospitals and you know, monitored appropriately. And again, there might be some situations that this would be necessary. Absolutely, for a period of time. Mm-hmm. There needs to be plans to get people off of these medications because if your doctor is not having that conversation with you when you go on a medication, you need to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. You are not, you guys, I promise you, the majority of medications given out today have not been studied on lifetime use. Yet we are on them for a lifetime, most people, because they figure my doctor gave it to me, I should trust my doctor, right? They wouldn't do me harm. Your doctor might not know because, again, we plan to have him on the podcast. I can't wait to have him on. I have so many questions for him. But Vince worked with Metagenics, which is essentially a medical-grade supplement company. Mm -hmm. And so he dealt with doctors all the time. And he said, they will not – medical sales reps will not tell you this because they don't want to make doctors look bad. And I'm not saying this to make doctors look bad, but to just have the realization – Doctors know less about the prescription they're giving you than the medical sales reps do. It doesn't shock me. There's, here's the thing you have to, to their, you know, credit. We have to think about all the insurance laws that have changed over the course of the years. When do they have time to do these things? Now COVID, hello, what happened? A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people walked off the jobs, right? They're understaffed. I know for me personally, just getting in with my OBGYN for my annual appointment, I'm pushed like two weeks out because they're understaffed. You one know? of one of our practitioners has a client who's a doctor. So she and she's a friend of hers too. So she talks to her quite a bit. I'm probably gonna mistake the number. It's probably four hundred. Maybe it was four thousand. It was something obscene. She has, I believe it was four thousand though. She said she has four thousand clients. Patients. 4,000 patients, patients. sorry, patients, yeah. 4,000 patients yep. that imagine, like, think about it. I don't go to the doctor every year. I know many people here don't go to the doctor every year, but yet we expect to trust our doctor knowing everything about us and protecting us. Like there is, they, they don't have a chance and that's no fault to them. That's what they're told to do. You know, you have to keep taking on clients or patients. You have to keep like to make the money to make them, you know, to cover insurance. They come to our office, mm-hmm. but like, how can we expect for them to be able to do their due diligence when they're given that situation? Yeah. It's impossible. So let's, let's you just, I did do some the, math. Three, do the math. 365. So think about your appointment. Your appointment's usually what, 30 minutes, if that. So if you think about an eight hour, six hour, I'll give you a six hour workday. That's 12, 12 patients per day for 365 days. That's 4,400 people. Mm-hmm. And that means people are going there daily. That's so, like you're going there annually, I should say. Yeah. So let's do the math on this, right? So let's say on average, nurse, doctor, they work about 12 hour shifts, right? Let's say yeah, one hour do. for they breaks. Work 12 hour shifts. Right? Yep. So let's take an hour out of there for breaks and whatnot. 
and they get 15 minutes, I believe is like the time cap for yeah, most they, appointments. Yep. Okay. So they're seeing 44 patients in a day. If they're seeing patients Good every God. 15 minutes back to back. I don't know how one would even keep up with all of that mentally. It would be so exhausting and draining because, I mean, then you got the charting and the notes and all that stuff. I don't think they're actually probably seeing that many in a no, day. But no. essentially, if you just took the hour by the 15 minutes, you know, that's what we're, we're talking about here. And so, you know, it's just the way that our medical system is, is default, right? It, it's faulty. There's a lot of issues with it. You know, one of the things that we talk about even with some of our clients is that, you know, they've gone and they've seen maybe natural paths. And Beck and I were having this conversation before we started podcasting today. I've had three clients come in where they've seen some natural paths. They've had some testing done. They were given a protocol, but it was missing a lot of pieces. They got the first part of a gut healing protocol. They got part one and two right? Remove some things from your diet and from the gut. Maybe they got a little bit of the repair, you know, with rebuilding and some probiotics and stuff like that, but they're missing a lot of pieces. And this is why so many people relapse with their issues because there's not the follow-up. I mean, we have clients that, you know, we're messaging weekly, like, Hey, if we're not on office hours, how are you doing? What's going on? We want to be in the know because here's what I don't want. I don't want somebody to not talk to me for three weeks and things have not gotten better or they've gotten worse. And we're not there to help them pivot and adjust. That's why we're so close with our clients that we work intimately with them. And if you're just going and getting a document that says my favorite document I've ever reviewed, by the way, it was from one of the hospitals here, I won't say which one, but it was from a dietitian that it, it wasn't her fault. It was just literally yeah. the standard uh, pre type two diabetic instructions. Oh God. It was horrible. You know, I mean, and I'm like, this is how that's not helpful. No, it's not. And, and you know, I have a client too that got a food sensitivity test. No. And it's like a bunch, it's an IgG test. It's not a test that I love. Um, and I was like, well, what did they tell you with it? She's like, well, she told me to remove the foods and then reintroduce them in 90 days. And I'm like, what about in between? What's going to make you in 90 days all of a sudden be able to tolerate these foods? You have to understand how the gut works. You have to understand why you're not tolerant of these foods. Like we need to look, we need to look at the big picture and it's impossible for, I think personally, we are currently seeing a shift to more functional medicine. I think the CVID did that mm-hmm. quite a bit because people stopped trusting mm-hmm. the, the government in a lot of ways and the medical system in a lot of ways because of the back and forth and ring and meringue. I think that we're seeing a shift towards functional the hard thing is obviously functional medicine is mostly out of pocket. Mm-hmm. But I think that we're going to continue to see a shift towards health coaching. Toward, and I'm not saying functional med, like functional is the end all be all. I think that we're going, we're going to see a shift of how it works. People start with lifestyle factors and habits and then they move into medical needs and all of like, I think that there is going to be over time because there has to be a change. There like, has to be. There has to be. You know, or more training not just for the doctors, but for anybody who's in the hospitals, right? For nurses, for their staff, it's not their fault because they're only trained in what they're trained in. Not that they can be an expert in all of these things, but maybe they have a support person that's there with them doing follow-ups. Um, you know, more nutritionists or dietitians or practitioners or, or whatever that are rising up and saying, hey, we've got to do something about this and the standard of care that we've been giving is not effective, because disease rates are continuing to rise, right? And we have this problem across the board. And so again, I go back to kind of what I said before, like it all starts in the home. So we have to be the example. We have to set the example. We have to train, we have to teach, we have to educate. And so that's you, you know, as a mom or a parent, listen to various podcasts, get books, you know, reach out to people. We've had some practitioners on our podcast that work specifically with kids that have worked with, you know, behavioral disorders and mood disorders and things like that, because it breaks my heart to see so many of these kids struggling. And now we're going to add weight into this category of, you know, medications. When we already have ADHD, autism, anxiety, depression rates that are higher than ever, kids being put on the medications, you know, and so it's going to be medication, medication. Oh, you need another one because you got a side effect from medication. You know, it's just, it seems like we're trending in a really poor direction. And I hope that we can shed light on this and that we can start to bring people back to center and say, Hey, let's first line defense here with our lifestyle and our dietary habits before we go down the path of potentially medicating somebody or having a surgery. Like, can you imagine a 13 year old having a surgery? 
a lap band surgery. We've worked with multiple people after bariatric surgeries. It's not, it's not good guys. Like it impairs all of your digestive abilities and the your function, nutrient, like your nutrient absorption, your cellular health. Like there's so many downstream effects. And I'm not saying that for some people it saved their lives. I'm not saying like, I know some of those people too, but just as a blanket, like the, it, here's my biggest fear. It just, it starts here. And then where does it go? Like this is, again, you guys, I mean, give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Mm -hmm. Like you have to think about long-term side effects of this type of stuff. So that nobody is Nobody asked our opinion. Nobody asked our opinion, but there it is. There it is. Hopefully you guys like this segment. Please give us feedback if you do. Um, Liz and I are always trying to obviously come up with different ideas on how to do things, different topics to cover, all that kind of stuff. Um, so please rate, review, subscribe to the podcast. That helps us grow. That helps us reach more people. That helps other people hear our unsolicited opinions and advice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you're pregnant and all these people keep telling you like all oh. the advice and you're like, oh my God, I just don't want to hear it. You know, just leave me in my, unco I love one of my friends um, from all state where I used to work is pregnant with twins. Oh my gosh. She um, has two kids <gasps> and they went to have a third and she got pregnant with twins. And she's like 36 weeks right now or like 34 weeks. She's pretty far along. And she posted a picture on Instagram the other day. And she was like, I carry this backpack around everywhere with me now. So I don't have to go up the stairs multiple times a day. <laughs> I remember my uh, old boss, his wife was pregnant with twins. She, she eventually had to go on bed rest, but she was petite. She was really active before. Uh, Man, she blew up like a, I mean, she, you had I to mean, like double imagine, door, open the door. I was, I, I was huge with one. No, I mean, not like her belly. Like I don't yeah. know. And it's amazing because she went pretty quickly back to her very It's amazing what the self. body does. Amazing. But I'm just like, how did her body even expand to that? Like, I'm telling you, we would open like double doors for her because she was just so big. I mean, and I, we have Veronica, <laughs> our pelvic floor therapist specialist was had triplets. Oh my gosh. I yeah. She was that. pregnant with Twitch. She had triplets. I don't know. I've been meaning to reach out to her because I've been, been reading so much about constipation, the pelvic floor and all oh, these yeah. crazy yeah. things. Um, but anyways, uh, so. All right, guys. No we'll one be... asked us, but there was our opinion. Hopefully you have an amazing hump day.